and let's see mutation tensor invariance and yes this expression is what you're talking about right yeah you so can there is there is uh, an alternate expression where you can write this in terms of one epsilon mm -hmm. um, but again this is a generic expression um, for a determinant of a tensor uh, and I think maybe that's one of the homework problems mm -hmm. okay um, so yeah uh, I would also like to mention again that even though I am assigning only three problems from the back of the book or from some problems I cook up um, it would really serve you well to try to do as many problems in the exercises that uh, in the book that you can and of course if you have questions about those problems uh, always bring them to my office hours or post them on the discussion forum um, be good to have a lot more activity on the discussion forum um, okay all right uh, so with that what we'll do is we'll jump back to um, um, where we were about last time so we were talking about these tensor invariants um, two types of invariants one was a primary invariant which was very sort of uh, formal formalically very easy to set up um, uh, you just take the tensor and the repeat uh, repeat the indices um, TII for example is the first primary invariant and for a general primary invariant, you can have, you can make sure that uh, the second index of the left tensor is the same as the first index of the right tensor. And you keep on doing that sequence and finally make sure that this last index is the same as the first index up here. So the result of all of these invariants is a scalar. Um, and of course, the good thing about invariants is that no matter which coordinate system you use, um, um, the result of this calculation in any coordinate system would be the same scalar. Okay. Um, question? Yeah. Nikita. When we say that the first invariant is T or one two two three and three one again. Um, so yeah, let's say it uh, as T I J, uh, T J K, T K I. Right, and all so three are in the, uh, all three are repeated indices. Right. If I'm not wrong, the T, T are the components of uh, the tensor. Correct. Right? Yes. So a tensor has nine components. Yes. Which will be uh, T one two, up to one three, then three uh, T three one up to T three three. Mm, right. So in F N, uh, if N, we yes. if we say it will be T one two, T two three, T three four. So where do we get that T three four? No, 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 no. Uh, I think, okay, so here, um, maybe I'll give you an example of, say, the 26th invariant. Let me say 26 because the 26 letters. Uh, so the 26th invariant would be T A B, T B C, T C D, so on all the way to T Z A. Okay. Now, each one of these indices, all of these A, B, C, D, all the way to Z, they are all repeated first of all. So that means that this is a 26 times sum for A123, for B123, for C123, for D123, um, and so on, all the way up to Z123. So this, how many terms are there? Three raised to the twenty-six terms. Okay. So there's no, so there's no, uh, like the index itself is not going up to four. Okay. Yeah. Hope that uh, that makes it clear. Okay. Um, all right. So um, those were the primary invariants. We also talked about the principal invariants. And as I pointed out last time, the underlying most basic concept about principal invariance is the fact that a tensor, when it acts upon an arbitrary sphere of vectors, it takes it to a new blue ellipsoid of vectors. Um, but there are at least three, um, at least three such directions, which here I'm denoting with these green arrows, N1, N2, N3. In those particular three directions, um, what will happen is that the effect of the tensor is such 
that the tensor will not rotate those vectors. In general, if you pick any other vector, for example, if you think of maybe this vector that's between n1 and n2, when the tensor acts on it, it maybe elongates it and also slightly changes its direction. But for these three uh, directions, the tensor will only uh, elongate or contract its length. It, it will change its magnitude only. Okay. And again, I'm saying uh, at least three. For a symmetric uh, tensor, symmetric non-singular tensor, there will be at least three such directions. Um, and uh, what, what we saw that, uh, what this particular statement, when you write it out in math, says that T acting on some vector n gives me the same vector n scaled by some scalar alpha, a scalar lambda. And this, of course, is the eigenvalue problem, which is why we were ending up having to solve eigenvalues and eigenvectors for tensors. And, um, and yeah, we listed out the first three primary invariants, which happen to be the, uh, the, the coefficients of the char characteristic polynomial. So this is basically stuff that, uh, again, confirms that tensors, tensor components can be formed into a matrix. And all of the regular matrix algebra that you've learned, eigenvalues and eigenvectors and all that uh, applies to tensors as well. Um, we were going through this example, and I think maybe about here is where we were last time. And maybe this wasn't perfectly clear what I did um, out here. So what I'll do is uh, I'll take one of these examples. Uh, let's say the case for lambda equal to 4, and I'll show you how to uh, find eigenvectors. Hopefully, you've already seen that and done that for your homework too, but uh, maybe it will help to repeat that. So the matrix that we had originally, or the tensor components that we had was 3, 0, 0, 0, 0, 5, 5 on the diagonal, and minus 1, minus 1. That was the original uh, matrix we had. We found that the eigenvalues were 3, 4, and 6. I'm talking about this eigenvalue 4 now. When we pick that and we, uh, when we want to find the corresponding eigenvector for eigenvalue 4, what we are doing is we are going to try to look for solutions of t minus lambda i times n equal to 0. We are going to look for non-zero values of such eigenvectors such that this equation is satisfied. So let's write this equation out in terms of components first. t minus lambda i is nothing but subtracting 4 from the diagonal. So minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. That's my, that's the matrix components representing t minus lambda i. The components of n I will write as v1, v2, v3, and equal to 0, 0, 0. I want to find a solution, non-zero solutions for v1, v2, v3 for this problem. Now, immediately you should be able to see that this matrix is singular, right? Minus 1 times 1, minus 1, 0. So determinant of this is 0. That's not a surprise because we, we pur purposely set it up that way because lambda is an eigenvalue and you, if, you, if you remove that, the resulting matrix has got to be singular, okay? Now, um, the, the way that we try to approach finding the eigenvectors is... Uh, uh, is realizing the fact that there is not going to be a unique solution to this. Therefore, to get one of the possible solutions, what we'll do is we'll fix one of those components. So let's say if I say v1 is equal to 1, okay? If I do that, I'll write it out. I'll write out what the equations give me. Um, so I have minus v1 uh, plus 0 v2 plus 0, v3 is equal to 0. All I'm doing is matrix vector multiplication. 0, v1 plus v2 minus v3 equal to 0. 0, v1 um, minus v2 plus v3 equal to 0. Right? And if you notice that if I pick v1 equal to 1, all I'm doing is I'm taking all of these components in this first, in this column up here, in this column, 
I'm multiplying that with the chosen value of V1 and I'm going to try to move that to the right hand side. But before I do that, you have to see whether uh, if I do that, um, if I take these guys and move them over to the right hand side and of course change their signs, so minus of this, minus of this, minus of this, what will what I will be left with on the left hand side is 0, 0, 0. So the first equation does not help me at all. The second equation is V2 minus V3 is equal to 0. The third equation is minus V2 plus V3 equal to 0. So both of these second and third equations are repeated. Are they they're the same equation really? Right? One equation says V2 minus V3 is 0, the other equation says V3 minus V2 is 0. It's the same equation. So in this particular case, choosing V1 equal to 1 does not work. That's why if you look at the notes, I said, okay, let's, if that doesn't work, let's go to the next component. We'll say instead of V1, I'll make V2 to be 1. And then I'll choose all of this components that I originally had here. I'll move them back to this side and choose the V2 components and move these guys over here. And I need to carry the signs as well. So let me try to do that. So um, so since I'm assuming V2 to be 1, I've just moved all of that to the right hand side. Once again, um, what I'm getting here, now the first equation is not the redundant equation. It simply says V1 plus 0 V3, which drops out to 0 plus 0 V2 equal to 0, which means that uh, the first equation, all that this is saying is that V1 equal to 0. Do you agree? The second and the third equations, again, we are... Uh, the second and the third equations, 0, V1 is just 0. And all they are saying is that V3 is equal or minus V3 is equal to minus V2. And the third equation is also saying the same thing that V3 is equal to V2. So implies V3 is equal to V2 is equal to 1 because that's what we had assumed up here. So now I have all the three components which immediately allows me to write that N2 because this is the second uh, eigenvalue, uh, second eigenvalue that we are finding. So N2 would be, N2 would be written as the three components, V1 is zero, V2 and V3 are one. And usually, and this is a perfectly valid solution, okay? This N2 is an eigenvector. But usually what we also want is to express our eigenvectors as unit vectors. This is not a unit vector. So if we just divide it by its magnitude, it becomes a unit vector. And that's why I added the 1 over square root 2. Okay. So the long and short of this process is that you had the original matrix. You set up this equation. That was the definition of the eigen, uh, eigenvalue problem. If you set up that equation, you'll see that it does not have a unique solution. So to make it a unique solution, you pick one of the components to be one. If that does not work with the rest of the equations, then you move to the next component, set that equal to one, and solve for the other two. That's all we're doing, okay? And there would be special cases sometimes when you have a repeated eigenvalue, in which case you might have to adjust this, but I'll let you uh, take a look at maybe standard linear algebra notes you can find that over the web anywhere and see how you can find uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues for a given component tensor, okay? Um, having done all of that, I will also say that this is not a course on linear algebra. I don't expect you to solve lots and lots of eigenvalue problems in, throughout the course. I expect that you will understand the concept behind it and you can use any tool you want from now on to calculate eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Some of those tools I've already mentioned on the um, on those notes pages that 
uh, you can use some numerical method to solve for the for the nonlinear uh, uh, for the nonlinear characteristic equation. Um, as hopefully some of you saw that for the homework problem, if you tried to write out the characteristic equation, it came out to be a nasty third order cubic equation, which is not easy to solve usually. And in this case, even though you might have been able to factorize it, in general, it is difficult to factorize those types of things. So what people do is to plot that characteristic equation and to find where the where the plot goes to zero. That's the that's the roots of the characteristic equation. Once you do that, there are good, nice numerical way, uh, numerical methods to be able to solve the um, solve for uh, these these roots. So again, that is not something that um, I'm going to talk too much about, but uh, you can use any tool that you want. Further, there's one tool uh, that I would like you all to get familiar with. Um, um, and of course, that's MATLAB. So I'll show you how um, you can generate solutions to this uh, eigenvalue problems in MATLAB and uh, lots of other problems. So we started MATLAB here. Um, how many of you are familiar with MATLAB? Most of you, but not all. Okay. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with MATLAB, it's if you want to think about it that way, this is a more fancy calculator, if you will. Okay. You already have programmable calculators. You can punch in a small program and it'll do something for uh, with your whatever data you enter. MATLAB takes that to the next level. And the benefit of MATLAB is that plotting things are is very easy. There is already a lot of inbuilt functionality in MATLAB that allows you to use it um, to do scientific computations very easily. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with MATLAB, um, if it will allow me to, yeah. So this right here is the command window where you enter any command just like you would do in your calculator. So what I'll do is I'll create a matrix first. And the way to do that is to say that T is a matrix, any matrix uh, is defined by having these square brackets. So in our case, the matrix is 3, 0, 0. That's the first row. To end the row, we have a semicolon. The next row is 0, uh, 5, minus 1. And the next row is 0, minus 1, and 5. And if I do that, I get the matrix P defined the same matrix that I have. Also note that when I do that, there is something called the workspace in MATLAB. Workspace is MATLAB's internal memory. So every time you execute a command or MATLAB executes a command from your program, it creates maybe a new variable or uh, operates on the existing variables to do some operation. Everything it does, it stores here in the workspace. So now I, can, I have a variable t created and I can use it whichever way I want. So in this particular case, I wanted to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this tensor. Um, so the command to do that is v comma d. That's the output that I want. And the command is eig. Um, and uh, I found, find the eigenvalues of t and store it in these two matrices again, V and D. What are V and D? As you can look at in your notes, um, those V and D matrices are nothing but D is the matrix of eigenvalues. Right along the diagonal, there are three, four, and six. Those were the eigenvalues that we found. V is the matrix where the columns of V represent the eigenvectors. So first column, 1, 0, 0, second column, 1 over square root 2, or minus 1 over square root 2, minus 1 over square root 2, and the third column, of course, is the third eigenvector that we got. So this is a, you can use this tool very easily to check your, uh, your computations that you, uh, that you do using your hand calculations. There's also other things that I mentioned on the, uh, on the handout. So things like trace. Trace is an inbuilt command in MATLAB. What should be the output of this? Trace t. 
Why is that 13? Sum of the diagonals, right? Trace is defined as TII. TII means T11 plus T22 plus T33. So indeed, that's the sum of the diagonals. Um, we have the second invariant also here on your notes and half times um, trace T um, trace T square minus trace of T square minus trace of T square. So T square again is just T multiplied with itself. Um, and again, 54, determinant is an inbuilt command. So there's a lot of inbuilt commands already in there which you can explore. And maybe the best way to explore that is to go to its help window. And that will open up something like this. And if you search here for getting started, and so it takes you to this section, which basically this section would be the first place I would go to and make sure that you understand how to use MATLAB, okay? And um, anything more than that, uh, you can keep on learning um, as you go along. Um, okay, uh, let's go back to this particular tensor. Go ahead. Um, okay, just going for, um, just for, for the notes. Okay. Uh, so for, um, for the last one, mm -hmm. for equals six, what if you plugged in uh, one for V3 and mm -hmm. you got zero, negative one, and one? That's still like... That is an eigenvector, absolutely. That is the negative of this vector, right? Yeah, so would that still be a correct answer? Because if you use, if you choose to plug in sure. V3 yeah. equals one, you just get, you get the same answer, you just get That's zero, correct. Right. negative one, and one. That's true. So uh, if you plug in V2 <coughs> equal to one, uh, you will get the negative of this eigenvector. And that's also an eigenvector, a perfectly valid solution. But just like we want our eigenvectors to be unit vectors, mm -hmm. a convention is also that the three eigenvectors, n1, n2, n3, should form a three uh, right-angled uh, triad. So after you find your eigenvectors, you can check that at least n1 cross n2 is n3, n2 cross n3, uh, n3 is n1, and so on. That, that means that it's in a orthonormal system. Orthonormal system means three vectors that are mutually perpendicular to each other and they are normal, meaning magnitude is one, and the fact that it's a right, ang uh, right hand orthonormal system. Uh, but yes, if you compute the negative of this eigenvector, I wouldn't mark it wrong. That's, that's a correct solution. In fact, any vector along this direction is an eigenvector, right? Um, so having done that, let me ask you this. Can anybody take a guess or think about um, what this tensor actually looks like? Can you think about what this tensor actually looks like? That's a difficult one, right? What does a tensor look like? <laughs> Like a what? Cube stress? Um, I mean, yeah, you can express it as a cube as well, but uh, we have been uh, showing tensors as ellipsoids. So if I take the arbitrary sphere of red arbitrary vectors, unit vectors, it goes to a blue ellipsoid. That's what defines a tensor. What ellipsoid does this tensor uh, correspond to? How, how can I visualize that ellipsoid? Uh, yeah, so actually Mohr circle is for transformation of coordinates. Uh, so, uh, but we are not talking about any coordinate system here. We are saying that I want to find out what this blue ellipsoid looks like. And what characterizes this blue ellipsoid? N1, N2, and N3, and their corresponding scalars lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. The moment I know lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and n1, n2, n3, I know what that ellipsoid looks like. Okay? These eigenvalues and eigenvectors completely characterize the, the tensor. So in this particular case, the tensor looks like a, tense, a blue ellipsoid 
that scales by three, four, and six in the directions n one, n two, n three. So, for example, if I were to draw uh, that is e one, that is e two, that is e three. My n one direction is along e one, so I'll draw n one right on top of e one. N two is between e two and e three, right? N2 is between E2 and E3. So between E2 and E3, I have maybe this direction right out here, that's N2. And N3 is between E2 and negative E3. So negative E3 is on the other side. So that is um, N3, but it looks like um, that does not form a right um, a right-handed orthonormal system. So to make it right-handed, I will also include that minus sign there. Okay, And then I can flip this N3 and that N3 would be pointing in, the, in between E3 and minus E2. So those are the three, those are the three eigen directions. I know for a fact that um, in the n1 direction, my uh, eigen, uh, my tensor will take that vector and stretch it three times. So I'll draw that negative three times as well. In the n2 direction, it will it will stretch it four times, four times. In the n3 direction, it will stretch it six times, so six times. Those three lines are the major and minor axes of that ellipsoid. Okay, now all I need to do is to somehow fit that picture into an ellipsoid. That's not a very good ellipsoid, but, um, but I think you get the idea. And in fact, what you can do is to take the planes n1, n2, n2, n3, n3, n1 to try to draw ellips ellipses rather than ellipsoids. So for example, I could draw an ellipse between these two planes, ellipse between these two planes, and anyway, uh, you, you sort of get the idea that knowing the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a given tensor, you can immediately visualize what that tensor would look like. Okay? Questions? Go ahead, Megan. Does it matter which one is going to increase for the eigenvalues? Oh, okay. So that's another convention thing. Uh, uh, usually we arrange eigenvalues in increasing order. So that's why we wrote it as three, four, six. But so there is a particular eigenvector associated with the line, uh, eigenvalue three. So you cannot switch the order of the eigenvalues with respect to the eigenvectors. But yes, in general, it mathematically it does not matter which way uh, you want to write all these uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But by convention, we write them in increasing order. All right, so that's basically uh, uh, some quick overview of what tensor invariants are um, and how you can find them and how you can visualize uh, a given tensor using those invariants. Let's move to some special cases, as I was mentioning. Um, it so happens that um, sometimes a tensor will have a repeated, the eigenvalues, uh, the characteristic equation for a tensor will have a repeated root, meaning um, lambda 1 could be equal to lambda 2 could, and uh, distinct from lambda 3. That's a special case where uh, what really that means is there are two such directions. In this case, I'm showing you, for example, uh, n1 and n2. There are two such directions in which the tensor will scale a vector by exactly the same amount without changing its direction, okay? And what that means is that if I were to draw this ellipse in the resulting uh, ellipsoid between n1 and n2, this vector gets scaled by lambda, the same lambda, and this vector also gets scaled by the same lambda. And this, uh, this ellipse ends up actually being a perfect circle, 
which means that any vector in in the plane of n1 and n2 is an eigenvector. Okay. So when the eigenvalues were three distinct eigenvalues, for, for the example we took three, four, and six, we got three distinct eigenvectors and exactly three eigenvectors. No other direction would be an eigenvector. In any other direction, if the tensor acts on it, it might change its length and it will have a small amount of rotation. But in this case, if you pick any vector between n1 and n2, all that this tensor will do is to scale its magnitude by the scalar lambda. In the third direction, which is n3, it will also scale it by lambda 3, but any other vector between this plane and n3 will get scaled and have a small rotation associated with it. Make sense? Question? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. There's no original ellipsoid. Uh, the ellipsoid is constructed by using lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3, right? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. okay, sure. And finally, we have uh, yet another special case of three repeated roots. If you have three repeated roots, which means, uh, of course, that you're taking, the tensor would be taking an arbitrary sphere of vectors to a slightly modified sphere of vectors. Um, slightly changed in size, it could still be a sphere. Now it's not an ellipsoid anymore, which means what? How many eigenvectors do I have? Infinite. Um, any direction is an eigenvector, right? Can you give me an example of a tensor that does this? Okay, identity tensor. Identity tensor just takes the red sphere of um, arbitrary vectors give you gives you back the same sphere itself. Identity so multiplied by any scalar. Not vector. Identity tensor multiplied by a, a, any scalar. That's correct. So uh, alpha times i. That's a tensor that has three repeated roots. What are the roots? What are what would be the eigenvalues of the tensor alpha times i? Alpha, right? Alpha, alpha, alpha on the diagonal, and that's your. Uh, <coughs> That's your example of a special case where three eigenvalues are repeated. Um, all right, so yet another useful concept for tensors, symmetric tensors. There is something called a spectral decomposition of a symmetric tensor. So just like when we say principal values, like principal stresses and principal strains, what we refer to as eigenvalues and eigenvectors, the word spectral also usually refers to uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. What does this mean? It means is it means that given a symmetric tensor, we can decompose this symmetric tensor into three parts. Which three parts? Three parts such that they are all characterized by uh, by the uh, by three individual tensors that are formed by its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So we can write any tensor in this form, which is equal to lambda i, ni, dyad, ni, where lambda i and ni denote the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. Question, how many i's do I have here in the indices? Three, is that a violation? That's a violation of the summation convention. That is why I have to explicitly write this summation out here, okay? If if it was only two i's, I could have omitted, I could have not written the summation. But since there are three i's, and it's an exception to the summation convention, I have to explicitly write this summation out here. So what this really means is that tensor T can be written as lambda one, n one diode n one plus lambda two, n two diode n two, and so on, okay? And um, let's quickly check for the tensor that we did, that we had on the previous page, uh, here, can you write down, maybe take a minute, write down the spectral decomposition of this tensor.
So hopefully you see the pattern that I'm looking for and let's just complete it out together since we have only a couple minutes left. Uh, so the tensor T is represented by 3, 0, 0, 0, 0, 5, 5 on the diagonals, minus 1, minus 1 here. And um, we are saying that the tensor T is equal to um, lambda 1, which is 3, n1, which is, um, actually then if I use the matrix, then I cannot write it as equal to, I have to write this, is represented by 1, 1, 1, and dyad means the outer product of two vectors. So 1, 1, 1, plus 4 over 2, and 0, 1, 1, outer product with 0, 1, 1, and plus 6 over 2 again of 0, 1, minus 1, and 0, 1, minus 1. If you multiply all of that out, what you should get is 3, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, plus 2 times 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, plus 3 times um, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. Is that correct? No, not 4 over root 2, 2, because there are two of those, right? Uh, this is n1, and that is also n1. So we have two, uh, sorry, n2s, two n2s there. OK. And of course, if you add them up, you can verify very quickly that indeed the sum of these three matrices gives you that original matrix back. Right. So that's yet another way of interpreting the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. It's saying that if you construct a tensor out of n1 dyad n1, n2 dyad n2, n3 dyad n3, multiply them with their corresponding eigenvalues, you get back the original tensor. That's why it's called a decomposition. So, um, so that's a neat, uh, a neat way to uh, express that. And it looks like I'll run out of time here again. Um, so. Um, I guess uh, on Monday, as I said, we'll just do a review session. Uh, everything that we covered up until last, until this Wednesday, just uh, in this week, would be covered, which includes eigenvalues and eigenvectors, but not the special cases or not the, any of the new material that we covered today. Okay. All right, so prepare well, and I'll see you on Monday here and then later in the quiz.